Consider Jesus, the heir of heaven, son of God and son of man. And as Philippians 2, 5 through 8 tells us, to adopt the same attitude that, as that of Christ Jesus, who, existing in the form of God, did not consider equality with God as something to be exploited. Instead, he emptied himself by assuming the form of a servant, taking on the likeness of humanity. And when he had come as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even to death on a cross. And it didn't just begin this humility, this humbleness, this moment of emptying himself didn't happen just here at this cross that we will consider today and these words that he spoke from there, but it began at the very beginning. God on high, Lord of lords, King of kings, born in a manger, placed in a feeding trough. Herod was after him as soon as he was born. His very existence in human form on earth, Emmanuel, God with us, and the one whose name means God saves, was met from the very beginning with disdain. And as he grew, the scribes, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the religious leaders, the Sanhedrin, and just humankind in general wanted him to be gone, and some wanted him for dead. He was threatened to be stoned to death on multiple occasions during his ministry, and his own family at times turned their backs on him and sold for 30 pieces of silver by one of his closest confidants, one of his disciples, one of his friends, betrayed by one that he loved. And he's placed on a cross with nails in his hands and his feet, beaten, bloodied, within an inch of his life and his first words on that cruel cross are words of a prayer. He utters a prayer. Not for himself. He utters a prayer for all those who had done him wrong. He utters a prayer for all those who would do him wrong. He utters a prayer for you. And for me, his first words on the cross are a prayer interceding for those oppressing him. Mocked, spat upon, beaten, bloodied, bruised, and whipped within an inch of his life, he utters an audible prayer asking God to overlook the wrong done. The supposed king of the Jews, supposed command of multitudes of angels in this moment, perhaps to some seemingly whimpering, they, cr they crane their necks. What is he saying? Is he saying, let, us, let me off the, the cross? Is he saying, I can call angels? What is he saying? And when they hear what he said, he hears words of a prayer on their behalf. Prayer is not just something we do out of religious ritual. Jesus gives us an example that when ministry can happen in that moment, when Difficulty is upon us. Prayer is an answer. Prayer is a powerful answer. I don't know if you know this right now, and every week at this time, there's a room in which there are ladies praying, there are prayer team members praying 
for you, praying for me, praying for God to move. Why? Because prayer is important. Prayer is strong. And Jesus in this moment utters a prayer that God answered just a few days later when throngs of people realized they're wrong and trusted in Christ for salvation. Prayer is significant. There's power in our prayers and may we never give up hope that God will hear our prayers and save sinners for whom we pray. Would you join me as we hear this prayer? Luke chapter 23, verse 34. It's very short, so you remain seated. But let's hear this prayer Jesus utters, and let's dig into what it means for you and me. This is what he prays on behalf of all those who had done him wrong. And he prays this for you and me. Then Jesus said, Father, forgive them because they do not know what they are doing. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's again examine seven things, seven truths that emanate from this prayer of forgiveness. And may it rest upon our weary undeserving hearts. Number one, we see that forgiveness has always been God's way. I want you to consider what the Lord proclaimed to Moses in the cloud on Mount Sinai in, and it's recorded in Exodus chapter 34 verse 6. This is who our God is. It says, the Lord, the Lord is a compassionate and gracious God slow to anger and abounding in faithful love and truth, maintaining faithful love to a thousand generations, forgiving iniquity, rebellion, and sin. Our God is a God of forgiveness. Consider what the Psalter said of God in Psalm 86, verse 5, when he said, for you, Lord, are kind and ready to forgive, abounding in faithful love to all who call on you. And again, he stated, the Psalter stated in Psalm 130, verse 4, but with you there is forgiveness so that you may be revered. Forgiveness has always been God's way and God's heart. The Israelites and other nations tested that time and time again. But we see even Isaiah 53, 12 foreshadowing this moment, foreshadowing Jesus' death on the cross and the forgiveness that is promised when he says in Isaiah 53, the prophet wrote these words hearing from the Lord God. He says, Therefore I will give him the many as a portion, and he will receive the mighty as spoil, because he willingly submitted to death and was counted among the rebels, yet he bore the sin of many and interceded. He prayed for the rebels. Jesus on the cross intercedes for sinners to find repentance. And I remind you of Romans 5, 8 that says, God demonstrates his love toward us in that while we were sinners... While we had done wrong, while we were rebels, Jesus died for you and I to forgive us of our sin. Forgiveness is available to us because of what Christ did on the cross. The cross is a source of forgiveness for you. And can I just say, yeah, you didn't deserve it. I didn't deserve it. Yet he gives it. I wonder if someone here today in this moment is thinking, God could never forgive me. 
It wouldn't be the first person in history to think that. You wouldn't be the first person that came into this room to think that. And so I wonder if there's someone here today just thinking, you know what? You don't know what I've done, Derek. You don't know the things that I have, how I have wronged God. You don't know how I've wronged people. You don't know what I've done immorally. You don't know the things that have been a, a sinful blot on my life. You just don't know. And I cannot in any way imagine that God would be willing to forgive me. This word from the cross lies in direct opposition to that thought. Forgiveness is available. If you have breath in your lungs, forgiveness is an opportunity for you. Forgiveness is available to you through Christ. Forgiveness is his way and forgiveness is available. Forgiveness has always been God's way we also see that forgiveness has Jesus identifying with us. In this moment on the cross, Jesus is bearing our sin. Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians that God made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God. In this moment on the cross, Jesus is acting as our substitute. He was wearing the shame of our sin. And so instead of forgiving sin himself, notice he doesn't say, I forgive them for what they're doing. There are other times in Scripture, there are other times in the New Testament where Jesus speaks to people. He says, I forgive you of your sin. Get up and take your mat and go. He speaks to them out of the authority that he certainly had to give them forgiveness. But in this moment... Jesus is identifying with you and I because in this moment, he is bearing our sin. He's bearing our shame. As Paul states, he became our sin. And so in this moment, feeling the weight of that, can you imagine bearing the weight of the sin of the world? Jesus felt the weight of your sin, and he did not condemn you in this moment. He asked God to forgive you. He asked God to take away what your sin had caused, to forgive it. In this moment, Jesus is identifying with our sins. He's bearing our sin and shame, beg, begging not for retribution for you and I, but forgiveness for those whose sins he bore. The book of Hebrews tells us he is our great high priest. And what that means is that Jesus knows the weight of your sin. He knows the pain of your sin. He knows the strength of your sin. And he knows because he bore it himself so that he could die to it and so that he could atone for it. And as he's bearing the weight of your sin and my sin, his first utterance is, forgive them. They don't know what they do. Forgiveness has always been God's way. Forgiveness has Jesus identifying with us. And forgiveness acknowledges wrongs done. Even if we sin out of ignorance, as this passage says, it says, forgive them for they know not what they do. Even if we have sinned out of ignorance, it is still sin and still deserving of punishment and in need of atonement. In this moment, when Jesus utters, they don't know, forgive them, atonement is being made on behalf of those he's he is bearing their sin. The, the requirement of Levitical law, even for unknown sins, there was a specific way of cleansing yourself, going to the priest, having your sins unclean, even those sins you didn't realize you had done. There was a way for every sin to be atoned for, to be cleansed for. And in this moment when Jesus says, forgive them for they don't know, he's, he's forgiving the sin even unknown to us. 
But what we're seeing here is that he's acknowledging that it is sin. It's very easy for you and I and our culture and our society, it's very easy for the rest of the world to tell us, well, you know, it's, it's the way that they, you know, they just don't understand or they don't know or that's not the way it is. Well, it doesn't matter. Sin is sin, and sin deserves punishment, and sin requires atonement for it to be cleansed, for it to be done right, and for it to be uh, made right in our lives. And here Jesus does that. The world in which we live, if we're not careful, we're, we're guilty of this as well. We love to sweep sin under the proverbial rug. And we excuse sin. And what Jesus does, he does not excuse sin, but he makes a way for sin to be done away with while acknowledging that it was sin. So may we never come to the place where we say, where we don't call sin for what it is. But may we very quickly come to the one who can cleanse us of that sin. Jesus took that punishment on himself and offers forgiveness. But we cannot and we must not approach God and pro approach Jesus flippantly. If there is unconfessed sin in your life right now, Jesus' seriousness in this moment should remind us that we need to take it seriously as well and eradicate it from our lives. Sin must not remain. Forgiveness has always been God's way. Forgiveness has Jesus identifying with us and forgiveness acknowledges wrongs done and forgiveness admits we are blind. You see, our sin sickness causes a spiritual blindness in our lives, and Jesus is willing to forgive our lack of sight. Those responsible for his death knew what they were doing. So when Jesus says, forgive them, they know not what they do. They knew what they were doing. They knew that they were convicting a man that they really had no bearing or no right to convict. They knew that they were obliterating his body. They knew that they were killing him. They knew what they were doing in a sense. But what Jesus is realizing and understanding and praying before God the Father and interceding on their behalf is they did not realize the whole weight of what they were doing. They did not realize the enormity of the, of the task at hand. They didn't realize how huge of a moment this was for all, for all humankind, for all eternity, they did not understand. And Jesus is acknowledging that they are blind in a sense in this moment. I wonder, are you blind to the enormity of your sin? That it was your sin holding Jesus on the cross. That it was your sin bearing down on him. That it was your sin that Jesus is acknowledging in this moment that there is forgiveness available, but are you understanding that or are we blind? Are you neglecting Jesus' offer of salvation now? Are you neglecting Jesus as being the center of your life now? Is some sinful, fleshly thing seeking to carry you away into apathy for spiritual things? Are your eyes blinded? I encourage you, like the blind beggar begged for Jesus to give him sight and spoke to him, and as a result, received his sight, pray now to Jesus to open your spiritual eyes and give you spiritual sight. Forgiveness admits we are blind, and forgiveness was both taught and demonstrated by Jesus. What we see here is Jesus, or what we see in Scripture is that Jesus taught his disciples to do exactly what he was doing in this moment. Matthew chapter, five, uh, Matthew chapter 5, verse 44, it says, But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. 
Jesus has given us an example to live by. May we have hearts that are willing to forgive, that are willing to pray for those who have wronged us. May we be willing to forgive those who do not deserve it, just as Jesus was willing to pray for forgiveness for those in that moment. Forgiveness also shows our need. Here in this passage, we recognize that God is holy and our sin causes us to be unfit for his presence. We have sin and it separates us from God. And God cannot simply overlook our sins. So Jesus bore our sin and asked God to enact his justice upon him rather than you. We're, we are unholy, unfit, undeserving of God's love, mercy, and grace. Yet God is a just God and God must punish sin and there is a punishment required for it. But in this moment, the love of God and the justice of God are held in perfect, perfect harmony because Jesus said, I'll take it. I'll bear it. I'll hold on to it. And so Jesus, in his love, bore our sin so that you wouldn't have to and bore our punishment so that you could be forgiven. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. You see, Jesus took on our sin, bore it, and took on the justice of God Almighty for you. He washed you clean. He forgives those who call on his name. Forgiveness shows our need And our need is for our sins to be forgiven. Have you asked Jesus to forgive you? Have you trusted in the cross of Christ? And finally, forgiveness reveals Jesus' redeeming love. By asking for forgiveness, Jesus offers love that redeems people. You are redeemable. You are able to be forgiven. You know you ought to. You know that you ought to ask for forgiveness. You know that you ought to trust in Jesus Christ. You know you know deep down you ought to put your trust in him, not only for, for the forgiveness of your sins, but for your entire life. You know. And you know you ought not leave this room today without expressing worship to Jesus for all that he has done. You know what you ought to do. I don't have to tell you. But here's the question. Will you do it? Will you respond to Jesus today? I'm not just talking about people that need to be saved. I hope there's someone today that you need the forgiveness of Jesus for your sins. I pray that someone will come in just a moment and walk this aisle. I pray that you will trust your life into Jesus' hands. I would love that. That would be the greatest honor of my life to be able to help you and share that with you and walk with you in that way. I would love that would make my day. That would make the day of our, one of our next team members who will be waiting in the chapel if you'd rather do that there. We would love for that to happen today. But the thing is, is that Jesus forgives us all. Amen. What we did, not just what we did to 
place our sin and the weight of our sin upon him on the cross. But what we did yesterday and what, we're do, what, we do, what we've done today and what we're going to do tomorrow that will still respond to him in a way like we just don't care. Yeah, Jesus, I know you died on the cross for me. Yeah, Jesus, I know that you uh, want to forgive me, and I know that you offer that for me, but I kind of like living my life for me. I kind of like doing the things the way I like to do them. I'm not sure that I'm ready to give that over yet. And you know you need to respond today, and I pray that you will. Let's pray. Jesus, help us. Whatever the response that needs to be made in this moment, would you help us to do that? Would you help us to acknowledge our need? Would you help us to give our lives over to you? We need you, Lord. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Would you stand? And as you stand, we're going to sing. And I pray that if God is working in your life in any way, that you would respond to him in this moment.